Okay, what is the first thing that comes on your mind when you see this color? Green. Yes. So the color green is always symbolized for Mother Nature or for the environment. In a lot of ways as well, the color green is something that is refreshing. It's telling about trees. It's about the rainforest, maybe even the greenery of the grasses. So in the next 18 minutes, okay, allow me to color your life in the color of green, the color of nature. I hope none of you have any allergic towards the color green. <laughs> Some of you might not like broccoli or something like that, but it's not related, it's okay. So, 15 years ago, I fell in love. I fell in love not with someone or something, okay? but I fell in love with a place in my home state of Sabah. This place is the Kinapatangan River. So this river, okay, this river, okay, this river, this river, ah, okay, so this river is Sabah's longest and most mightiest waterway. It stretches 560 kilometers long from Sabah southwest all the way to the east. Along its way, it drains a very large catchment area of more than 16,800 square kilometers. This river is a lifeline. Lifeline not just for the wildlife that inhabits this area, but also a lifeline for the local communities who inhabit this area. So I'll show you a map, just in case, okay? Any one of you do not know where the Kinabatangan River is. Some technical issues. So if you're not sure where the Kinabatangan River is, you can have a look at this map, okay? So I come from the northern part of Borneo, from a state called Sabah. And the Kinabatangan River, okay, is that bluish stretch that you can see in the central spine, yeah? that goes all the way out to the east. So it's a very large catchment area that holds a lot of diversity of wildlife, and arguably as well, that the Kinabatangan is the last remaining forest-covered floodplain that is left in Southeast Asia. It basically holds one of the last connections of forest that connects the upland forest all the way down to the mangroves. And in this area, the amount of diversity is just simply spectacular. It's simply spectacular. When I was in the Kinabatangan River, I just was mesmerized okay, by the amount of diversity of species that I see here. And at the same time as well, it is home to indigenous tribes, the river people or the Orang Sungai, that uh, has been living in this area for generations. And they're very much dependent on not just the river, but also the rainforest uh, for the survival. Unfortunately, uh, and uh, the Kinabatangan, uh, my first exploration on the boat on the Kinabatangan River changes a lot of what, you know, the passion that I have for this area. Uh, changes a lot the passion that I have for this area. Uh, my first observation out on the boat, uh, it, it reconnected me to Mother Nature. As I was gliding peacefully along the river, it was very calm, and the amount of species that I saw, uh, from canopy-dwelling species like the Borneo orangutan, to the show-it-all-out uh, proboscis monkeys, uh, to the magnificent gentle giants of the rainforest floor, the pygmy elephants, and all the way to the beautiful hornbills that glide up in the sky. It's truly a magical place, and I fell in love in this area mainly because of this. The biodiversity of species was just simply amazing. Unfortunately, the Kinabatangan has been having serious pressure in the past 50 years. One of the biggest challenges that we are facing in this area is forest fragmentation. All right. So if you do not know what forest fragmentation is, uh, try to imagine uh, that we, all of us here, individual species of, let's say, various mammals, uh, we are isolated in small pockets of just living within the campus of UC 
CSI. Around us are gaps where there's no way for us to cross through another population and live somewhere else. So we are fragmented. So what happens when forest fragmentation occurs, okay, is that the wildlife species have less spaces to roam. Eventually, difficulty in looking for food resources. We will start to also see a genetic isolation that will eventually lead to a genetic collapse. And that will mean extinction for a lot of species. So in Sabah, unfortunately, okay, we have lost one very iconic species. That is the Bornean or the Sumatran rhino. This species is already considered to be extinct in the wild. So we do not want any of the other species that we have you know, in the whole of Malaysia to go and have a similar fate like the rhino. So what is the best way to mitigate these kind of challenges? Huh? There's only one way. We have to reconnect back the corridors. Uh, we have to link back up areas of the forest together through what we term as an ecological bridge. This ecological bridge will allow the wildlife species to move from one area of the forest to the other without any problems. We need to create a safe haven. So it's something like, you know, creating an ecological corridor from where we are, from this campus, uh, maybe to get to the nearest mall or something like that. Alright, so we need to create those corridors. So our project was established in the year 2008 together with my organization, Aid Malaysia. What we aim to do in the Kinabatangan is to enhance the landscape and also to support the local community by providing them an alternative source of livelihood which will enable them to support us in our forest conservation venture. And all of this is being done through a tree planting project. So our project's name is GRIP. It stands for the Corridor Restoration of Animals that are Threatened and Endangered in the Kinabatanga. And on this picture, you'll be able to see me eh, standing on a tree that I planted just two and a half years ago. So basically, the uh, work at the forest restoration site is not easy. It is extremely challenging. Eh? This is what we see on site, all right, within the gaps of these forest corridors. Some of the areas that we are working on as, are as big as 10 football fields put together. And the only thing that you see is just grasses. Grasses all the way. And some of these grasses are so thin that you won't be able to see what's at the end. There's no clear path to go through. Most of these gaps, unfortunately, most of them are very bad in terms of its soil condition. They are depleted in terms of nutritional value, mainly because of the past activities that used to, be, to happen here, such as logging. So normally when we think about the rainforest, we always think about tropical environment, there's sun, there's rain. Naturally, forest regeneration will just happen on its own. Why is forest regeneration not happening within these gaps? So if we think about it, the birds will eat a fruit somewhere there. Animals will feed on some fruits over here, and as they cross in between these gaps, they will drop seeds. And naturally, in a forest, these seeds will take root and they will start to grow. But why are they not growing here? Why do we have to come in and plant trees? And the single reason is because these seeds are never able to reach down to the soil surface. The grasses are just too thick. So what happens is that the seeds drop down, but they get eaten by a lot of other koala that comes into the area, or either they get, they get desiccated by the extreme temperatures of sun. So what we have to do? We have to do it the hard way. All right? So the hard way is, our project, we employ a lot of what, we, what I like to term as jungle ninjas. Okay? So as you can see, they're really jungle ninjas. Huh? They are our Jedi's in the rainforest, and they're holding, you know, Machetes. So basically, our project uh, works in a way where we use tourism as a form, all right, as a form of activity to support the tree planting cause. So we get volunteers and also interns to come into our project. They are paid to participate in the project. Okay. So for a lot of them, it's an experience in a lifetime to not only work in the rainforest or to enjoy an experience working in the rainforest, but at the same time, they are also able to contribute towards rainforest protection and conservation. So we do a lot of training with our team on how to use tools efficiently, safely as well. 
and the work that is required on the field. So our volunteers help us out from the preparation of plot for planting, all right, and then eventually to the whole replanting process itself. And one of the most important aspects of forest restoration as well is not just the plot preparation and also the planting, the human intervention that has to be that has to come into this area for planting, but is the maintenance process. So the maintenance process is whereby we would have to take care of this tree as a child after it has been planted. So just like, you know, if any one of you have, like for myself, I have children, but any one of you who have younger siblings, brothers and sisters, you know how difficult it is to raise them up, okay? You need to nurture them, you need to nourish them, you need to protect them. And that's the same thing that we do with the trees as well upon planting. Because in the first one year, mortality is always at its highest. Most sites, we have uh, mortalities that can reach more than 70% if we do not do maintenance. So maintenance is whereby we come in to clean the tree, to weed the tree of anything that is trying to grow on it. Now because in a tropical forest, weeds, grasses and everything, they will just try to take over the tree. So we want to prevent that from happening. So in a year, at least three to four times, we will come back to the site up until the tree reaches its fourth year. Then we will start to reduce the maintenance process. So in the past uh, 10 years or so, our project has planted more than 20,000 trees on the ground. We have been able to reconnect back to about 20 over acres of forest areas, which used to be a gap, all right? And these 20 acres is very similar to about 21, 22 football fields put together. And we planted a wide variety of uh, plant species. Most of them are fruiting and flowering trees, uh, which will be vital for the animal life in this kind of environment. So what are our progress? Uh, this is after one year. After one year, you'll be able to see that the gaps are slowly big with trees that are slowly starting to grow. And on the ground, most of the trees after one to one and a half years, they will start to get much more higher than me. Right? And the circumference are becoming bigger in terms of the stem structure. Six to seven years later, this is what we have achieved. Right? The trees have regenerated up to an average. I say thank you, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, okay? There's still a lot of work that needs to be done, all right? But this is what we see on the ground right now in most of the trees that have been planted six to seven years ago. Now, we do not need to do much already within this area. We just allow the rainforest to do its own cycle because the trees have already rooted themselves. The stems are very well established and they start to develop a canopy that is preventing excessive sunlight from coming to the ground. And as the leaves from the canopy drops down to the ground, they disintegrate, they break down, and they will provide nutrients back to the trees, and it's an upcycling of nutrient back, and that's how they just continue to grow. So when they reach to this stage, we do not need to do any more maintenance. We just let nature take its own course. So from a canopy level, this was a recent drone photo that I took. Just imagine, 10 years ago, it's a big gap. 10 years later, we have been able to establish a proper connectivity of forests within this area. So, you know, quite recently it was a very big thing. On social media, Facebook, IG, everybody posting up my 10 year challenge, selfie here, selfie there, and I tried to look up for my selfie 10 years ago maybe. This is my 10 year challenge. Right? This was my 10 year challenge. As you can see, it's a big difference that you can make to the environment if you put your heart into it. It's not an easy work, but we have been able to do it. So, as the rainforest slowly recovered back up again, the connectivities are starting to come in. We are starting to also see the return of wildlife species into the area. Can you guess on the first picture? that I'm doing like this, wearing my camouflage shirt. What do you think? What species do you think made that? Elephants. Elephants, yes, true. That tree was planted six years ago. Imagine that, that tree was just that small, three feet. 
And now it is much more bigger than me. It has a much more bigger trunk. And elephants, the smallest elephant species in the world, the pygmy elephants, are using the three as a... <laughs> I'm not dancing, okay? I'm not good at dancing, but I'm just showing you how they try to rub their back on the bark of the tree. Okay? So a lot of our trees in our forest restoration sites now are trees that they use as a scratching pole. All right? And what about the next picture over there that I'm happily pointing? What, can, what, what is out there? Can you guess what species made them? Any guess? It's an S, yes. What animal made that S? Orangutan, yes. Sir. So orangutans, if you do not know, orangutans is the only great ape in Southeast Asia, all right? That is from Borneo, Sumatra, right? that makes nests, okay? And they make nests up on the canopy of the trees. They can make up three to four nests in a day. And this is a tree that we have planted as well about six years ago. And for me, it is a very big achievement because orangutans never used to cross through the ground. But now, they're starting to utilize the rainforest back up again, all right? So these are some of the work that we have done on our camera trap surveys. Huh? These are some of the species that have come into the area as well. And from this picture also, we are able to see who is the culprit uh, in trying to damage our trees in the first one year. Right? So the project, uh, happily to say, uh, we are able now to ensure that the local communities who last time had a very big resentment okay, towards conservation, towards the idea of forest protection, we're able now to contribute back, contribute back to the local communities through our project. From accommodation, from the providing of meals, to the hiring of local guides, to the usage of boats, the purchase of saplings, we take it all from the local community. So the project, we plant trees, but we ensure that the local communities get the big benefit out of it as well. All right? Because the local communities are the most important aspect in forest conservation. They are the most important aspect that we need to try to nurture. If we do not get their support, then conservation do not mean anything. All right? So, this is our vision of a forest, you know, that we hope we will be able to achieve in years to come from the trees that we are planting now. Uh, planting a tree is planting a hope. Planting a hope not just for ourselves, but for our children and also for our children's children. The rainforest is not just home for a lot of the wide variety of species that I've so shown just now, but the rainforest has a very important role in ensuring that all the ecological functions that we are enjoying right now in planet Earth can still be enjoyed. Just think about the fresh air that we are breathing, okay? not this air conditioned air, okay? the fresh air that we are breathing, the clean water that we are drinking, all of this comes from a healthy and a pristine rainforest. All right? So as a conclusion, right, just a few things. In the past 15 years uh, since the project has run, we have learned uh, that when you put positive energy towards what you love and what you are passionate about, and you put it into actions, you will be able to achieve something that is much more rewarding in the end. It might take a while, but you will get there. All right? Secondly as well, in times when it's very challenging, all right, it is very easy for all of us to just, you know, step back and give up, all right? You have to persevere. You have to persevere, you have to re-strategize if you need, but at the end, you will be able to reap the rewards and get the achievement at the end, all right? So, as mavericks or misfits, all right, all of us here, including myself, and I'm still fighting for it, we all have the responsibility, all right, to protect the environment, to protect planet Earth together. So when was the last time each and every one of you colored your life with nature? Thank you.